The only real hope and change you'll ever get is from God. It's going to come from the Lord or it's not going to come at all. It's going to come when you admit that you can't do it and that you've got to have His help. Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. Matthew 7, 23. Jesus' most famous message, the Sermon on the Mount, focused on the hearts of his listeners. He targeted his disciples as the audience. It may seem unusual to hear that even our all-knowing Lord admits to not knowing something or someone. However, Jesus refers to a type of knowledge that relates to personal relationships rather than intellectual knowledge. As Jesus concludes his Sermon on the Mount, he provides a final caution regarding true faith. According to Jesus, there will be fake Christian prophets who will disguise themselves as harmless individuals. Matthew 7:15. Beware of the false prophets, teachers who come to you dressed as sheep, appearing gentle and innocent, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. Even if they use religious language and exhibit power, they do not truly belong to the law. Even if someone appears to be a Christian to others, they may still be considered an evildoer by God and be sent away from his presence, as stated in verse 23. Only those who follow God's will and are recognized by him will be able to enter heaven. What's important is not that we know God to a certain extent, but that God has knowledge of us. As Paul explained, whoever loves God is known by God. The Lord tends his flock like a shepherd, Isaiah 40, 11, and he knows who are his sheep, John 10, 14. I am the good shepherd, and I know without any doubt those who are my own and my own know me and have a deep personal relationship with me. Those somber words, I never knew you, depart from me, ye that work in equity, shows that Jesus is indeed omniscient. He did not know them in the sense he would if they were his followers, but he knew their hearts. They were full of iniquity. Isaiah's condemnation of hypocrisy fits this group well. These people come near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Isaiah 29, 13. The evildoers who Jesus does not know are fake Christians and false teachers. Revelation 22, 15. Outside are the dogs, the godless, the impure, those of low moral character, and the sorcerers with their intoxicating drugs and magic arts, and the immoral person, the perverted, the molesters and the adulterers, and the murderers and the idolaters, and everyone who loves and practices lying, deception, cheating. Jesus cautions that one day he will tell a set of religious practitioners, I never knew you. God takes no delight in sending people to hell. 2 Peter 3 9. The Lord does not delay, as though he were unable to act, and is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is extraordinarily patient towards you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. At the judgment, they try to justify themselves as worthy of heaven on the basis of their works, but it will not work. While claiming to do all these good works in Christ's name, they fail to do the only work of God that counts, to have faith in the one he sent. And so Jesus, the righteous judge, condemns them to eternal separation from him. A popular Bible commentator noted, this warning of Jesus applies to people who say, Lord, Lord, and yet their spiritual life has nothing to do with their daily life. They go to church, perhaps fulfill some daily religious duties, yet sin against God and man just as any other might. There are those that speak like angels, live like devils, that have Jacob's smooth tongue and a sow's rough hands. Jesus claimed to be the one people must face on the final day of judgment and is rightfully called Lord. This must have been a staggering statement to some. There was a little known teacher living in a remote area who believed he would be the ultimate judge of all people in the future. By saying, in that day, Jesus drew our attention to a coming day of judgment for all men. What is the chief object of your life? Will you think as much of it in that day 
as you do now? Will you then count yourself wise to have earnestly pursued it? You fancy that you can defend it now, but will you be able to defend it then, when all things on earth and time will have melted into nothingness? Spurgeon. Lord, Lord, have we not? The people Jesus spoke of here had impressive spiritual deeds. They prophesied, cast out demons, and had done many wonders. Although these things are great, they hold no value about genuine fellowship and connection with Jesus. Significantly, they even did these things in the name of Jesus. Yet they never really had a relationship of love and fellowship with Jesus. We read, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Ultimately, salvation is based on knowing Jesus and being known by him, rather than just verbally confessing or relying on spiritual work. It is our connection to him, by the gift of faith that he gives to us, that secures our salvation. Connected to Jesus, we are secure. Without connection to him, all the miracles and great works prove nothing. What a terrible word. What a dreadful separation. Depart from me, from the very Jesus whom you have proclaimed in union, with whom alone eternal life is to be found. For united to Christ, all is heaven. Separated from him, all is hell. Jesus is the judge. The keys are in his hands. To depart from Christ is the very hell of hell. It is the foundation of all the misery of the damned. To be cut off from all hope of benefit from Christ and his mediation. One's true faith in Christ is tested by their obedience to the Father's will. Simply saying, Lord, Lord, and claiming belief is not enough. One must also follow and obey the Lord's commands. It's possible to acquire a religious lexicon, commit Bible verses and religious hymns to memory, but still fail to follow God's will. Those who are truly born again have God's Spirit living within. With the help of the Holy Spirit, they are able to understand and follow the will of the Father. Romans 8, 9 But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. God's love in their hearts motivates them to obey God and serve others. Romans 5, 5 Now hope does not disappoint, because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit, who was given to us. Once the door is shut, it will never open again. However, some people hold on to the hope that the door may open, but there is nothing in the scriptures to warrant such an expectation. So everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them will be like a wise man, a far-sighted and sensible man, who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods and torrents came, and the winds blew and slammed against that house, yet it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish, stupid man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell and the floods and torrents came and the winds blew and slammed against the house and it fell and great and complete was its fall. Matthew 7, 24 to 27. Christ's listeners can be categorized into two groups. Those who hear and follow his teachings and those who hear but do not act on them. Christ preached now to a mixed multitude, and he thus separates them, one from the other, as he will at the great day, when all nations shall be gathered before him. To hear Christ is not just to give him the hearing, but to obey him. The Lord was illustrating one main point. Our profession of faith in Christ will ultimately be tested before God. Those who have trusted Christ and have proven their faith by their obedience will have nothing to fear. Founded on the rock, their house will stand. But those who have professed to trust Christ but have not obeyed God will be condemned. We cannot lightly dismiss this sermon, for it is God who gave it to us. We must bow before him and submit to his authority, for we will all be judged. Matthew 7, 28-29 when Jesus had finished speaking these words on the mountain, the crowds were astonished and overwhelmed at his teaching, for he was teaching them as one who had authority, to teach entirely of his own volition, and not as their scribes, who rely on others to confirm their authority. The sermon was excellent, and it's likely that more was said than was written here. 
Now, they were astonished at this doctrine. It is to be feared that few of them were brought by it to follow him, but they were filled with wonder for the present. He delivered his discourse with a tone of authority. His lessons were law, his word a word of command. Christ upon the mountain showed more true authority than the scribes in Moses' seat. So the question is, how to serve God acceptably? It is one thing to walk with God and serve him the way we want to, and yet another thing to serve him according to the pattern or manner that he desires. Remember when he told Saul that obedience is better than sacrifice. This meant that we can't seek to serve God on our own terms, only in line with his own known will. It's important to distinguish between these because so many people have vehemently asserted that they have walked with God and done his will only for God to say, depart from me. Number one, come with reverent submission. The word of God gives us an in-depth insight into how Jesus prayed. We were not there to see it, but thank God for the Bible. Hebrews 5, 7. In the days of his earthly life, Jesus offered up both specific petitions and urgent supplications for that which he needed with fervent crying and tears to the one who was always able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission toward God, his sinlessness and his unfailing determination to do the Father's will. We are told why God always hears the prayers of his Son. It says that Jesus was heard because of his reverent submission. How do we show this reverent submission? Hebrew 5.7 refers to the time that Jesus prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane, and this is the description of what took place at that time. Reverent submission, therefore, consists of saying to the Father, not as I will, but as you will, your will be done. It consists of renouncing our own will and accepting the will of God. Jesus gave us a prayer to use as a pattern. It is, of course, what we call the Lord's Prayer. In part of this prayer, he included this very principle. He taught us to pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You come to God, you need to say, your will be done. Those simple words mean you're saying, if my will is not aligned with yours, then I set aside my will. You are saying, when our two wills conflict, let yours have free course. Number two, be genuinely dedicated to God. Dedication speaks of commitment from the heart that isn't easily disconnected or discouraged. 2 Chronicles 15, 14 to 15. Moreover, they made an oath to the Lord with a loud voice, with shouting, trumpets, and with horns. All Judah rejoiced concerning the oath, for they had sworn with all their hearts and had sought him earnestly and let them find him. So the Lord gave them rest on every side. It is essential to see that they got their rest after their genuine dedication to God. The same way we can find true rest when we make a choice to be truly dedicated to God. When we are truly dedicated to God, we naturally enjoy His covering and that absolute heart commitment pleases Him. When we are truly dedicated, it is only natural to carry His presence and therefore see His supernatural manifestations. The truth is that some persons that are called by God's name because they are often seen in His house have hearts that are so far from the living God. Number three, we must be sacrificial in our walk and work with God. Stewardship to God requires a certain level of sacrifice. This is because sometimes obedience may be inconvenient to our flesh, even though it is necessary to walk in God's blessings down the line. Sacrifice usually involves our time, skill, energy, time and resources to see that the kingdom of God advances on the earth. Daniel comes to mind when we talk about this kind of sacrifice. He left his comfort as one of the top advisors of the king and put his life on the line just to stay dedicated to God in prayers. He defied that order because he was ready to sacrifice everything for the pleasure of the king he serves. Abraham also knew what serving God sacrificially felt like. Let us pray. Father, I am grateful for every privilege that you have ever given me. Thank you for opportunities to seek the advancement of your kingdom. In the name of Jesus, I ask for the grace to serve you acceptably with joy, dedication, and commitment. Amen. Notice also in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers. It takes the grace of God to change us, folks.
How can you be saved if you're not willing to repent? And the Lord Jesus Christ said, except you repent, you shall all likewise perish.